good to be here with you guys. Um, like Anil said, my name is Dominique. Everybody calls me Dom. We're family, you guys can call me Dom. Um, it's really good to be here. It has been quite the week, so I'm just very thankful to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna start with a bit of a personal testimony. Um, not, not of my salvation, just of like a really tough period of my life. And I'm hoping that this will be able to tie into, well, it will tie into the rest of my sermon. Um, so I'm sure most of you guys have had a really rough period in your life. Um, for me, that was 2018. 2018 sucked. <laughs> it was really hard, especially the last half of 2018. And there were a lot of reasons for that. Um, the, one of them was just, circumstantially, I had way more going on than I needed to. Um, I was working at a job full-time as a program manager, um, just not operating in my giftings and working like well over 50 plus hours a week, and it was a very stressful um, opportunity. Um, I also decided that uh, it was time for me to go back to get my graduate degree, and so I was like, no big deal, I'll do full-time grad school and full-time work and it'll be fine, and it wasn't fine. Um, on top of that, in the span of about two months, I went on two international mission trips, and each week I was in counseling. And counseling I have a love-hate relationship with because it's great and it's wonderful, but it's really hard. And so um, <clears throat> circumstantially, there's just, there's just a lot going on in the last half of 2018. But um, the part that really made it difficult was the emotional... Um, stuff that was going on inside of me, the stuff that people couldn't necessarily see. Um, I'll get into this later, but there's this idea of core beliefs. And I was unearthing a lot of my negative core beliefs that I had about myself. And that's just a really hard thing to come to terms with. So there's like depression that hit, and just it made it really hard to deal with all the circumstances. However, one thing that I didn't understand that was happening um, until a little later, there were two kind of distinct things going on within that period of my life. One happened within the midst of what I call, in my mind, my dark days. <laughs> um, and so one night in the fall of last year, I was sleeping. And I had like a rough time sleeping during that time. And I woke up and I had just this overwhelming sense of sadness. And so I, I live with three roommates, and so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to go cry, but like, I have to cry quietly because I don't want anybody to hear me cry. So I went into my dining room, and I just sat at the table, and I just weeped for what felt like a long time. But I just, I don't really like showing emotion, and so it probably was like 15 minutes, but it felt like a long time. And so, and I didn't understand why. I'm like, well, what is the core of this? Like, I know things are, not going well, and so I was just crying out to God. I was like, God, why? Like, why am I feeling this this way? Um, and God brought to mind um, Dominique, like way in her early um, Christian days in college. And in, in college is where I received Christ. And um, it was my baby days. And I remember sitting in my bed in my dorm room with, one, with my accountability partner. And I remember this prayer that I prayed, and I had asked God, and I said, God, whatever you have to do, uh, I just want to be like you. I don't care how painful it is. I don't care what you have to strip away. I want to be like you. This is a very stupid thing to pray. And I didn't realize what I was asking for, um, but God was showing me. He's like, I'm being faithful to you. I'm answering your prayer. Um, it's hard. You're stripping away a lot of things. You're unearthing a lot of things. but..." Um, this is me answering your prayer. So that was the first thing that was happening during that time. And I was like, okay, I guess I asked for this. Um, and the second thing, I think God was teaching me about the subtleties of the flesh. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about today. And so if you guys would turn with me to Romans 8, we are going to be in chapter, um, in chapter 8 in verses 5 through 17. And I'm just going to read that for us. So it says, <clears throat> Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. 
The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. I'm just going to pray for a second. Um, Father God, I thank you for this word that you've given us. And um, as Anil prayed, Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me, that these would be your words, Lord, and not mine. And um, I thank you just for this passage that's, uh, it has a lot in there, God, and I just pray that you would give me the grace to handle it well. It's your name we pray. Amen. Um, so, going through, like, this preaching cohort, they teach me to, like, make the big idea short and catchy and easily rememberable, but this is a very, this passage has a lot of things in it, um, and I couldn't, like, make it rhyme or make it short. So here's what I have for you guys. <laughs> so the big idea that I hope that we can, like, walk away with at the end of this is that the person who lives by the flesh will die, but the person who is led by the Holy Spirit will choose abundant life. Um, so before we dive really deep into this scripture, I want to just take a second and do some preliminary definitions. Um, so first, we're just going to talk about flesh. Um, for some people, it might be like, what do you mean by flesh? And it's a very good question because we don't really use that much outside of Christian context. Um, and so in the Bible, the flesh is used in two primary ways to actually talk about our physical bodies, like your actual flesh. Um, and it's also t used to talk about our sin nature. And that is primarily what Paul is using here. He's talking about our sin nature. Um, in Galatians 5, Paul, again, um, talks to us about what are some of the works of the flesh? How can we identify this flesh? Um, some of the works of the flesh are sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. So flesh equals bad. That's in our mind. Um, the next one is the spirit. So the spirit is God, is part of the Holy Trinity. If you are a believer, the spirit lives inside of you, guides us to goodness, convicts our hearts when we do things that are wrong. And the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, and so spirit, good. Flesh, bad. Spirit, good. That's kind of the thing we just have to take away with this. And they're very like opposing forces, as we're going to be able to see um, in, in this text. And so let's dive into the first four verses, verses 5 through 8. Um, I'm going to read that over again just so we're refreshed. Um, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So our first point is just kind of screaming at us from this passage, right? The battle between the flesh and the spirit, it begins in our minds. Uh, the word mind is said several times in these, these, four, these four verses. And this seems obvious, right? Like, you would think easily that things begin in our mind, but we tend to be a people that kind of operate by what we can see. So if I'm 
sitting here and I see that I have sinned outrightly, I can be like, okay, Dom, get that fixed. But maybe what I'm not doing is looking inside of my thoughts and my minds and seeing like, hey, this, what's in here might eventually come out into my actions and turn into sin. How can I stop that? Um, take my imaginary friend, Bill, for example. So Bill, he is sitting in his counselor's office and he is very distraught because he uh, ended up cheating on his wife with a woman that he met on the internet. And so his marriage is in shambles, his three children and his wife have lost a significant amount of trust for him. Um, and he can see that he's messed up. He sees the consequences of his actions, right? But what would have happened if Bill, about four or five years ago, when he started to, to notice the discontent that he felt in his marriage, what if he would have said, hey, let me address this. Let me think about where this is coming from. Maybe we should go to counseling. Maybe you should find the root of this. What would have happened if Bill, four or five years ago, would have taken note of the lustful um, thoughts he was having towards other women, um, rather than them turning from like fleeting thoughts into things that he's ruminating on, into things that he's um, thinking about doing, acting on, into pornography, into chat rooms, and then eventually meeting the woman that he would cheat on his wife with. Family sin doesn't just happen. Um, people don't wake up one day and just decide to murder somebody, for the most part. Um, the <laughs> yes. Um, it, it starts in our mind and it starts with our thoughts. And this is something that we, we don't take for granted as much and it's something that's very personal. Because I can't say what your thoughts are or what your thoughts are. Like I can't discern that. That's between you and that's between God. Um, and Paul makes this link between our thoughts and our actions very clear. He says the person who lives according to the flesh has their minds set on what the flesh desires. Your life, your actions are in conjunction with your thoughts. And there's also this idea here that's important about being governed or ruled. He said the mind that's governed or ruled by the flesh, um, and he says the mind that is governed or ruled by the Holy Spirit. So this isn't, this isn't a sermon where like, I'm asking you to like, doubt your salvation or anything like that. That's not, that's not um, the purpose of this. But so, because I know when I read this, I'm like, dude, I have sinful thoughts. Like, what? <laughs> um, where's the Holy Spirit in that? But there's a difference between having sinful thoughts and being ruled by them. There's a dis difference between um, feeling guilty for your actions and feeling conviction by the Holy Spirit. Um, you cannot submit to the authority of two things at once. So I can't claim that I'm a law-abiding citizen of the United States and have a meth lab in my backyard. They just don't, those two things just don't go together, and they shouldn't. Um, so we have this idea, right? We have the battle that begins in our mind, and we, we have these sinful thoughts and this idea of being ruled or governed by the flesh. So how do we take control of what's happening in our minds? Um, well, Paul has a lot of wisdom, and in another book, in 2 Corinthians, uh, verses 10-5, he tells us to take every thought captive. And that's an interesting term, and whenever I hear it, I think about airport security. Some of you guys, I'm sure a lot of you guys have flown before, and if you haven't, you've seen movies of the airport security line. And so what happens is you're in this lo usually ridiculously long line, and um, once you get up to the front of the line, you have to take off all the essentials, your jacket, your shoes, any electronics, your bag, all these things, and you put them in this bin. And if you're lucky, you don't get randomly checked, but sometimes you do. <laughs> Sorry, no. um, And so you put them in this bin, and the bin slides through this big machine, and it's an x-ray machine. And so the x-ray machine pauses, it looks in the bin, and it examines all the contents of the bin. And what it's looking for are things that don't belong. It's looking for weapons, excessive amounts of liquid, just things that you're not supposed to bring onto an airplane. And I know one time when I was flying out of DFW, I had traveled the world with my keys, right? Like I've been several places. And I, on my keychain, I have this key 
that looks like a cube that's actually a knife and it was really cool um but i wasn't like intentionally trying to smuggle this thing onto a plane or like stab somebody it's just on my keychain i forgot it was there and so <laughs> the airport security guy he's like oh you thought you were slick and i was like i really did it like i just <laughs> forgot about it so he took that thing that did not belong um and he so that going forward the flight would be safe um there would be no difficulties but what if we did this with our thoughts? What if we have in our mind, like, these are the things that I'm thinking. What belongs and what doesn't? What's going to be beneficial and what is not? What's going to bring glory to God and what is not? Sometimes it's not even an issue of whether it's sinful or not. It's just, is it beneficial? Um, what are you allowing to get into your mind in the first place? We live in a society where everything is so accessible to us. Um, we have TV shows, music, all kinds of things that have not necessarily wrong concepts or things that are outrightly sinful, although there's a lot of that too, but just are the things that we're letting in, are they going to be beneficial to us? How do they affect our actions? Do they normalize certain behaviors so that it doesn't seem like such a big deal when we make the same mistake? Um, these are hard questions to ask. I'm an avid Hulu and Netflix user, like I understand. Um, it's hard, but when you realize that sin, that battle starts in your mind, you start to kind of take heed of like, what's actually, what am I allowing in there? So we see that the battle takes place in our mind. That's our first point. What else does Paul have to say in the rest of this passage? Um, if you guys will look with me in verses 9 through 11, Paul says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if, this, if, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. I'm sure many of you have heard this old Cherokee proverb, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, so a while ago, there was a grand grandfather who decided to teach his grandson about life. And he told his grandson, he said, um, grandson, there is a war that is going on within me. There are two wolves. One is an evil wolf. This wolf is angry, sorrowful, regretful, arrogant, self-pitying, guilty, resentful, inferior and prideful and the good wolf is joyful peaceful kind benevolent empathetic compassionate truthful and faithful so the grandson looks up at his grandfather and he's like which one is winning and the grand the grandfather says the one that you feed and it's really interesting to me because you can easily replace the description of the evil wolf with the works of the flesh, right? Sexual immorality, impurity, and the description of the good wolf with um, the fruits of the spirit. Um, what I want us to understand is that if you are a believer, you are fighting this fight. Um, until we come to glory, we're always going to have to deal with the flesh because we live in a broken and sinful world. Um, but this battle has already been won for you. Paul tells us that the same God who raised Christ from the dead performed like the craziest, most mind-blowing and world-changing event that has impacted us in such an incredible way. Um, who rose our Savior from the dead, who took that same God is living inside of you. That same God is inside of you. There's no reason that we should be um, just submitting ourselves back to the authority of the flesh. Um, the greatest tool to defeat the flesh is, is living inside of us. It's, it's right there. Like, he understands what you're going through. He's been through it, too. Um, to turn, to be a believer and to turn our backs on the Holy Spirit and kind of walk in this flesh nature, it, it's kind of like if you're at home and you're sleeping one night and you're having a really great dream, Say it's like the Cowboys actually doing something in the playoffs. It's a dream, so things can happen. Um, 
and then you're, you're woken up by a really, um, by the smell of smoke. And so you go to your doorknob and you touch it and it's hot and you're like, crap, my house, apartment, whatever, it's on fire. And so you try to find lots of ways to get out of the house. You try to open your window, but it's stuck because of the paint. Pretty soon the fire enters the room, gets closer and closer to you, and all of a sudden your pant leg is on fire. And this pain is the worst pain you have ever experienced in your life. And just when you're about to give up and give in to the pain, a firefighter comes crashing through the window, takes you out of the house, throws you on the ground, throws a fire blanket on top of you, the fire is extinguished, you get taken to the hospital, get a nice salve to put on your leg, you're soothed, you get a couple of days to heal, you're all good. And you're so thankful for that salvation because it would have been excruciatingly more painful to burn all the way. And so as you're um, coming back, your Uber driver is driving you back home and uh, you see another burning house and you tell your Uber driver, hey, dude, can you pull over right, right quick? And you go and you jump back into the fire. And the Uber driver is obviously just shocked. And then it's just like, why? So you hear that and you're like, why would anybody do that? It sounds ridiculous. But this is, this is very similar to what we do when we've been saved by this God who is gracious and who has promised to take away our pain and who gives us this um, assurance of eternal life, um, joyful and glorious life. But when we turn back and we submit ourselves back to um, the flesh and the sin, we're just putting ourselves back into this pain cycle that uh, will only pain be getting more pain. That's all that we're really asking for. Um, and so I want to caution believers. So this is, uh, this is kind of what I'm talking about, about the subtleties of the flesh. So in my dark days, I mentioned something called core beliefs. And core beliefs, so the thing that got me wasn't my outright sin. Sure, there's definitely outright sin. I am the first to admit that I'm an imperfect human being. But it was more of the sin that was internalized, the lies that I believed about myself. That was the thing that really killed me and like really got me. Um, and so there's this idea of core beliefs. And core beliefs are things that you have internalized that you believe about yourself, about the world around you, that kind of inform the way that you react to situations and uh, the way that you interpret the world. And so I won't have a counseling session with you guys, but I have a, I have a couple of the core beliefs that I'm uh, still working through. It's definitely, but I mean, now that I've got to unearth them a little bit, it's been not as bad. So an example of a negative core belief is that I'm unworthy of love. And so somebody who believes this, they, the way that they act and interact with the world is going to show this. So for example, um, in an effort to disprove to myself that I am worthy of love, what I might do is be like, hey, let me stack up my load so high um, and try to be like really great at all these things at one time and then maybe if I'm really great at all these things then somebody will, then I'll be worthy of love. Did that. Um, maybe I will um, try to form relationships and at the slightest hint of like rejection then it's just like the shame spiral of um, oh this is proving the fact that I'm unworthy. So all of these, all of these things, all these unhealthy habits that I would have um, they're a result of what I actually believe about myself. And so this is what I mean, family, by the subtleties of the flesh. Sometimes it's not going to be outright. I'm, I wasn't going out every night and getting drunk and doing all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Um, if you looked at me from the outside, you would think that she looks kind of sad, but like she's not doing anything that's crazy or that's super wrong. But it's inside of me. It's these lies that have attached themselves to me from childhood that I've just kind of believed and have kind of informed all of my actions. And so this isn't spirit-led at all. This isn't, these lies are the complete antithesis of what the Bible tells us and what Jesus tells us and what the Spirit of God tells us that lives inside of us. And so I just encourage you guys, what are, the, what are the things that you believe about the world? What are the things that you believe about God? And 
How are they influencing your actions? Um, so we, we've discussed a lot about the flesh and some of the tricks of the flesh, um, but I want to shift our focus a little bit more to the joyous aspect um, of the Holy Spirit. So if you guys can look with me to Romans uh, 8, verses 12 through 17, we're going to get our last point in here. <clears throat> and it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So the first thing that Paul tells us in verses um, 12 and 13 is that our obligation isn't to the flesh. Um, it's to the spirit. And he says, if you live according to this flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So, key, key, major key right here, guys, is uh, you cannot defeat the flesh in your own power. It is by the Spirit, with the Spirit's help and guidance. Um, please don't try to do it, because you will fail. <laughs> and it's not, it's not a fun thing to do. I've done it several times. Um, by like setting up schedules and all of these things like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and then I fail and it's just like right back down the hole again. So make sure you're praying about it. Talk to God. What do you want me to do? Um, and secondly, our third point is that Paul, Paul shows us that a life that's led by the Holy Spirit is an abundant life. Paul tells us that we are God's children. We are immeasurably loved. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you guys totally understand. It even says that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So my own self that's telling me, hey, I'm unworthy of love, the Spirit of God's coming at me and be like, nah, boo, like, you are loved. <laughs> You've got, you are a child of God. He has adopted you as his child. Um, I no longer am a slave to fear as a believer. I... Um, I can let that go. I work with um, teenagers who are addicts. And I can't help but relate everything to everything else in my mind. That's how it works. It's just like this web, right? And so as I'm writing this sermon, I'm thinking about, about them. And I'm thinking about how my kids, they don't be, they, most of them don't choose addiction or choose to use because they're seeking some kind of thrill. Um, it may start off like that. They might, they might be with some friends and decide to do insert anything that you can imagine. They've done it. Um, at, at the core of that though, when we really get down and get to talk to them one-on-one -on -one, and we get into those groups where they really open up, they are using because they're recipients of imperfect love. Um, whether that looked like a parent who's addicted and is so far into their own addiction that they decide, why not bring my child along and have them hit this blunt with me or whatever that looks like, or whether that be like years of emotional and physical and sexual abuse. Um, we're all recipients of imperfect love because we are humans and we are in relation with other humans. And so the humans that you are in relationship with are going to hurt you because we are imperfect um, and that's okay we've been given grace so we can give that to other people when they hurt us but our perfect we are perfectly loved by God we are loved by the only person who knows everything that is every single shameful thing that you've done he knows and he loves you for it he says son he says daughter I love you. 
regardless of your sin. Yes, you got to deal with that sin. He's not just going to, like, he, he, he believes in discipline. Um, but he loves you regardless of that. And God doesn't want slaves. Um, he, does, he wants people that will choose him. I'm sure you guys have all seen some kind of show or movie that's dealing with a love potion, right? Some poor soul is dealing with unrequited love, and so somehow they get their hands on a love potion, and they secretly sneak it into the drink that their, ob their object of affection is drinking, and then they're blindly in love with them. And so in every single episode or show that I've seen that's happened, it never turns out the way that the person expects. Because at the end of the day, love cannot be taken and not, cannot be demanded. It has to be given. And so God wants us to choose him. That's why the Holy Spirit inside of us, it's not going to force you to run away from the flesh. It's not going to force you to come to church. It's not going to force you to forgive the person that hurt you so deeply. Um, God wants you to choose him because he's chosen you. He chose you regardless of all the things that you've dealt with and the, the sin that you have in your life. Um, and if this isn't enough, we get to inherit the kingdom of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God. Dude, this is a great life that we're living. Paul does, he does tack in at the end of this, which I noticed. Um, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And I'm like, hold on. You're talking to me about all this like, great stuff that's going to happen and how I'm a child of God and then you're going to like, throw in sufferings. Um, but he does expand on that in the rest of the chapter. It's a whole other sermon. So the life isn't going to be easy, and we know that. We've all experienced pain and hardship. Um, but the, the goodness that we inherit is so much more than the sufferings that we're going to uh, face in this world. We just have to let the Spirit lead us. Um, so, in conclusion, um, so, like I said, big idea, big takeaway is that the person who is led by the flesh, or who lives by the flesh will die, but the person who is led by the Spirit will choose abundant life. And hopefully you understand why I chose the word choose abundant life rather than have abundant life, because it's your choice. It's your choice. Um, we saw how the battle for territory happens in our mind. Um, whether we're going to submit to the flesh or the spirit. That happens up there. Um, you saw that if you're a believer, you've been freed from the bondage of the flesh. You no longer have to submit to that. Um, if you believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus, you have faith in him. Um, if you're sitting here and you're like, I'm not a believer, but that sounds kind of interesting, there will be people in the back um, during communion that would love to pray with you. Um, and I'd love to talk to you after service if, you know, feel that um, and then lastly we saw that if we get to if we choose the spirit we choose to live an abundant life um, I think it's so funny how we can freak out about celebrities and um, like I have a my my roommate who just moved out she watches The Bachelor and she just saw one of the one of the, I don't know which couple I don't know which couple lives here there's a couple that lives here and she saw them at a coffee shop freaked out she that the, yes that one <laughs> um, she saw them at a coffee shop and she was freaking out and I'm like oh I mean for me I, I might freak out about somebody else but not the bachelor um, and so but we freak out about celebrities but we know the creator of the universe y'all like we know like the most famous dude ever and he's super controversial so if you're into that <laughs> he's that too um, so just like realize that rest in that like we have a really we're we're in some pretty famous people territory ourselves and that famous is living inside of us i'm just saying if somebody else claims that about a human being we should pray for them um and i just want to encourage you guys um can encourage you to continue fighting uh it's not easy to fight against the flesh it is imperative that in this life you give yourself grace and you give grace to those whom you love and whom you're dealing with. Um, people are going to hurt you. You're going to hurt people. Give yourself grace because God has given you endless amounts of grace. Um, and lean on 
your brothers and sisters in the church. As High School Musical would say, we're all in this together. Um, that's all I got for you guys. Let's pray. Um, Father God, I'm so thankful for my family, God. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be here to speak um, about your word, God. I thank you for the spirit that indwells us. And Lord, I confess to you that I've, I've been sinful in several ways, and I've uh, submitted myself to the flesh in many different ways, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to help me, as well as my brothers and sisters here, to evaluate what's going on um, in our minds, to be able to be open and authentic and honest with our community and with those people around us when we start noticing patterns in our minds and try to catch sin before it turns into anything um, more than it is already, God. Um, I just pray for your wisdom as we go forth. Um, how can we apply this in our own lives, Lord, and just convict our hearts? Where, where would you like us to change? Where would you like us to grow? Um, and give us the tools um, and the people to do that with. And God, it's just, I thank you. It's just, it's just great to be here. And I just love you, God. And I um, pray that we can glorify you throughout the rest of this week and the rest of our lives, Lord. It's your name we pray. Amen.